And I believe we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my stream. Uh, today, during the stream, I'm going to hope to interact with the video. I've never really done this live before, so you'll have to bear with me as I try to get that to work. It is also raining outside, so if you can hear like a little pitter-patter, pitter-patter, that's, that's the rain outside. So my hope in this video is um, I very recently, uh, Gavin Ortland did an interview with a guy named Matthew Adelstein, and Matthew Adelstein uh, I hope I'm getting these categories correct, is an agnostic who is battling with the probability of theism. And uh, on Gavin Orland's channel, they talked uh, about theology, and that's when I first got interested in. But there is actually an interview on Matthew Edelstein's channel, which is um, more in-depth in on their specific debates around universalism. Matthew's position is that Christianity becomes much more likely and much more plausible um, if universalism is, is true. Now, Gavin Ortland and most classical Christians don't believe in universalism, myself included. Um, but I think this is an interesting argument, interesting way to look at these issues. Uh, one of the things that really interested me in this that I think lots of people kind of interact with is, you know, Gavin and I think lots of Christians when they get into these conversations, when they start these conversations, are ready to defend the plausibility of truth claims Christianity makes about events, about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, uh, and all these other things. You know, here's all the proof for the resurrection. Here's this, that, here's that. But it doesn't really seem like Matthew's very interested in that. And I think you can be very critical of that if you want to be, but I hope in this I can try to uh, be very sympathetic. I was in a very similar place to uh, Matthew when, before I became Christian. And I think uh, I was asking a lot of the same questions, I was having a lot of the same thoughts, and I'm hoping I can kind of bridge that gap for him in this video. If he sees it, that would be great. Um, but also just for people who are wrestling with the same issues about, you know, is universalism uh, necessary for God to be good? All these other kinds of things. And I think Matthew brings up some good points in this video that I'm going to try to address, but I, I to, to kind of make the opposite stance makes sense. Now, what you could say, and I think a lot of people will be tempted to say, um, I'm not sure if Gavin says this in the video, I don't think he does, but there, there's this idea that you could just be like, okay, well then be a universalist and become a Christian. Of course, it feels dishonest to do that be, as a, if you're a Christian who doesn't believe in universalism because you don't think it's true probably for some reasons. And I think it is slightly different than, you know, there is a point in the, in the debate where, um, Matthew's like, hey, aren't you a Calvinist to Gavin? And Gal Gavin's like, yes, but there are other viable positions like Arminianism, that if you were an Arminian, you would be Christian. And to argue from that, if you think it's more plausible, you should. Um, and I think there, there, are, there are situations like that, that we can all agree, oh, I'm a Calvinist or I'm an Arminian, but if somebody was one was the other, I would be fine with that position as, as them assuming that position and, and being a Christian. But I think universalism is definitely not one of those positions. Gavin definitely does seem to think of annihilationism as a position that Christians can hold and that he would be willing to convince Matthew into annihilationism. But I don't think, and, and I, I would probably agree, I think annihilationism is a lot more um, within the bounds um, uh, than universalism. And why isn't universalism okay? What does this mean? Um uh, he doesn't, we don't, they don't really address issues like purgatorial universalism. I think that's basically the type of universalism Matthew seems to be arguing for, uh, is, but based on some of the clues. And we won't probably watch the whole video, but we will go through the video um, in a number of places. I'm going to have to try to find all the, all the sessions. So strap up, buckle in. We're going to tackle the issue of hell. Is hell reasonable? You know, uh, and this is going to get into one of the core differences, and they do kind of butt heads on this in the debate. But what a lot of Christians get to the point where they start to say, okay, well, it's actually about these factual claims. And if Jesus is real, and he is Lord, and he taught this doctrine, it doesn't really matter if it makes sense to me. And we'll talk about this in the first clip we watch, but um, it's just true. Versus Matt, Matthew doesn't seem to kind of think that way yet. And I think you get there once you start to uh, understand the Christian worldview, it all starts to make a little bit more sense. And I think part of that comes down to in the secular world today, we don't think of submitting to an idea because of the authority that 
that gave us that delivered that idea, we don't think of that as a good as a good in itself. Um, and we'll break this down in a, in a minute. Okay, but let's start. Let's see if I can get this clip to play. Um, we'll start to to see if, if if you guys get what I'm saying and the distinctions that I'm trying to to bring out here um, between the different positions. At, uh, playing just a okay. And that's a distinction that they're going to kind of get back to that. I think Gavin harps on that. I don't think Matthew is there yet on that distinction, but Gavin's like, okay, here's what's true. And Gavin also, in addition to that, Hello, I'm back. I think I'm back. Jeez, this is this is a uh, not ideal. Unfortunately, I think this is just we're just gonna have to endure this. My Wi-Fi just think about the way that he's framing this. Hopefully, my stream is still working. Think about the way that he's framing this. He's framing hell, and and I think this is a very Christian way of thinking. There's stuff that's good. There's this divine essence that we need that we're trying to get closer and closer to this is very tabernacle conversation type language you know approaching goodness approaching divinity uh, and you can be very far from divinity that's the way the christian thinks but if you listen carefully to as the as the debate goes on matthew's objections come from a different kind of understanding of 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 morality of of, of many things, of what what's fair, these kinds of questions. And um, maybe that'll illuminate itself in a second. I sped it up a little bit. Hopefully you can still watch and hopefully you can still hear um, them talking. If you can't, again, just message in the live chat saying that you can't hear. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the, the, the volume comes through. Wait, see, so this is how this is going to go for a little bit. And, and if you're watching this, Matthew, don't think I'm trying to attack you, but Think about the difference in what you just said and what Gavin said, or what he just said if you're not Matthew, right? Talk to him, starts talking about plausibility. He's going to go into what I see a lot happens, and I did this when I first became Christian, but you'll start to say stuff like, oh, but I hear this other model of hell that is bad. I've heard a good one that's good to me. I've heard these appealing ones versus Gavin wasn't saying anything about which one, which version of the world was appealing. In fact, he says the opposite. He says the doctrine of hell is a painful one. Um, but Matthew's still working through what he thinks is more logical. And this doesn't make sense, actually, from his worldview. You might, your instinct might be, well, who cares? But from his perspective, he's saying, it's actually linked to the moral argument for him. He's saying, 
if I believe in goodness, I believe in all these things. If goodness is true, then God is true. And if God is true and goodness is true, then a moral God would be proved by universalism in his, in his position. That would make it cohesive worldview. But um, the way that he's approaching it is kind of, I, my under is his understanding of those concepts, his, um, what's it called? His, uh, uh, um, apprehension of the issues, his, you know, if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense to him in the way that it is, it has, it, it'll only kind of click once it does make sense to him. Well, let, let me finish the clip actually. Yeah, and he talks about this too. Eternal conscious torment is the thing that he's focused on. You can find Christians in the comments saying, disagreeing with eternal conscious torment and all that kind of stuff. And he, him, it's like, that's not fair. But, but think about it. Why Why wouldn't eternal conscious torment be fair? And you might be like, wait, Joe, I'm, I'm a Christian and I can see why that would why that seems rough. But think about why you think of it. And we'll talk about this in, when I finish the clip. And that's what he's kind of kind of thinking about in this conversation, if that makes sense, okay? He's thinking about how does this worldview vindicate our moral, and he literally says, uses the word moral intuitions. And I don't think he would put it this way, but I do think this is a, a genuine understanding, but he has certain moral intuitions. He's looking to see validated in this worldview. And I think that the, the reason he's running into struggles with that is because he has a different worldview. Hopefully this works as well. But in the the secular worldview, there is this idea that suffering is the same as evil. Does that make sense? So like if 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 you were an internally good God, you would minimize suffering and maximize goodness. So when he sees God is actively introducing suffering into the world through eternal conscious torment, he says, well, there's no... Um, there's no, what's it called? There's no deterrence quality to that. There's no anything. He's just introducing suffering in, in eternity. So there's something you could even do in a retributive sense that would be, have an eternal consequence that would require eternal punishment. And that is his mathematical problem. And that is the way that our world kind of trains us to think about morality. But I, I would say that the, that at, at, in, in a sense, the, the good is trying to get rid of suffering. Suffering is is the bad thing, if that makes sense. And so anyone who is trying to do a moral worldview is trying to minimize suffering. And in a Christian worldview, you can account for suffering being bad. I mean, no one is going to argue that suffering is good. Um, but we, we actually would disagree that suffering is kind of um, inherently uh, uh, evil if that makes sense. That's the, it is the evil and that you can build up this thing called suffering and you can build up evil in the world. And as you accumulate more evil, you've accumulated more suffering, you accumulate more evil. Cause that's not, I wouldn't say that's how the Christian thinks about this. You, you can read Augustine and we'll read through a little bit of Augustine uh, in a second, but evil is actually the absence of good. And Gavin hinted at that earlier, right? Is there's this, it was the, 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 um, Christian worldview is that there is there is good. There's God, and that is good. God is good. God creates good. God is constantly emanating good. Like good is just kind of shooting out of God. And relationship with God is the definition of good. And you cannot have a relationship with God. Um, and evil is the like dark, shadowy places where um, there is no God or where God is not present immediately to you or you're struggling with God or, or all these things. That's the that's what evil is. And so when but when Gavin makes appeals and other of his apologetics in his books to that line in Lord of the Rings where, oh, well, everything. Um, everything become good in the end, basically what. Uh, Matthew's thinking about is suffering will be over. So he, con he the idea of hell is a contradiction to that. Versus, I, I actually do think the biblical perspective is that sometimes suffering is a part of our 
endearing our, our, our furtherance of our relationship with God. And in that sense, or it's, it's even a furtherance of God's glory. It's a furtherance of this and the other thing. And in that sense, suffering actually is good. I mean, this is the point of the cross, right? So I think if you would, if you would do adopt this secular worldview and try to start calling yourself Christian, you'll run into issues with the cross. And this is what the Mormons do. So in the, in the classical Christian worldview, right, the, the suffering accomplished on the cross was actually a, a beautiful, necessary act for, for goodness, okay? In the Mormon worldview, they, it brings up this issue of, uh, well, why does God just like snap his fingers and make good happen? Right. If you were if God was had, had a cosmic balance sheet of suffering and, and not suffering in the world and he was trying to maximize goodness, he would just do that. He would just snap his fingers and good would happen. So in the Mormon worldview, uh, Christ actually atoned for humanity's sins in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was crying tears of blood because he chose to. And that the cross was just actually human, a sign of human evil. It was a rejection of God on the part of humanity that was 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 bad. Um, and I have a whole video on why Christ had to suffer on the cross, but but basically, the the Christian worldview disagrees with this. We don't we don't this isn't Christian. Um, they're, they're opposed worldviews, and so it until you get to this worldview, you you actually won't be Christian. So that's why I think it is strategically important not to argue for Christian universalism. In my opinion, now there might be some Christian universalists watching this, and they might have their objections, and that's fine. But even if you are a Christian universalist, I think it would be, you know, I, I don't know. I, I do think there, that Christian universalism is bad. I won't, I won't try to mince it. But I, I would be more sympathetic to a Christian universalist who, who said, who took this worldview and, and argued for Christian universalism as opposed to this worldview, right? Which is not, not the Christian worldview. In, in my opinion. Okay. Um, what this also reminds me of, uh, this whole context, this whole conversation is, and any, if anyone has any questions, if you can't hear me, if you can't hear me, let me know. Like I, I this stream had, was having problems just a second ago. So if, if you can hear me, send, give me like a thumbs up in the comments. That's great. And, and that would be perfect. Okay. The next thing I wanted to read was um, St. Augustine. So I think what he, what what is happening here is not only just a conflict between worldviews, but also, you know, I talk about this in my presuppositionalism video, but we as Christians, great, thanks, Caleb. We as Christians, at first, especially when we were like highly intellectual, we like thinking about things, we like logic, we like reason, we like to come to these issues on our own terms, if that makes sense. And we've got the things we care about. And to a certain extent, Christian apologists should um, kind of co condescend in a way or talk to people in these ways. That's what I'm trying to do in this video. We should try to adopt the, the other perspective so that we can speak into it. But I think we also have to recognize and, and in some way communicate that the Christian, eventually the enlightened Christian perspective is that this attitude that the rejector is taking is the rebellious thing that's not good in the Christian worldview and that we need to address it. And now that doesn't mean you, you can't ask questions and doesn't mean that you should reject asking questions or thinking logically or believe, having a rational worldview. Don't mean that at all. But let me let me try to read this from St. Augustine's uh, confessions on the way that he looked at the scriptures when he was young, a young person uh, seeking an education. I believe he's 19 at this point. And this is right before he embraces Manichaeanism. So a different worldview he thought was more logical. But he was his mother was Christian. He was raised vaguely Christian. And so he's kind of wrestling with these ideas. And so he says here, I resolved, therefore, to direct my mind to the Holy Scriptures, that I might see what they were. And behold, I perceived something not comprehended by the proud, not disclosed to children, but lowly as you approach, sublime as you advance, and veiled in mysteries. This is how he's describing the Scriptures. They're not immediately available to the... Like, this is, this worldview actually doesn't make sense to you when you come at it with this way of thinking. And this is going to be a problem I think Matthew runs into when he starts bringing up Bible verses and things like uh, trying to, from outside the Christian worldview, uh, and, and then taking them kind of, in my opinion, out of context to address what he thinks of as classical, the classical doctrine of hell. 
And and this is the way St. Augustine talks about himself. So, so this isn't even an issue of you're elect or not elect. St. Augustine eventually becomes a classical Christian. And in fact, I would think most reformed Christians would uh, would 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 see him as as a model of how it is. But this is just how you come to these things with a certain uh, approach. Okay. And he continues, and I was not of the number of those who could enter into it or bend my neck to follow its steps. What does that mean? Think about that. Bend his neck to follow. It literally just look down, right? You think you're when you're when you're kind of. And he talks about this way of looking at philosophy, and he talks about reading Cicero. Um, he loves philosophy. He loves rhetoric. He's talking about it up here. Um, and, and he loves wisdom and he loves these issues, but he, you know, and he does think wisdom is, is good. I actually think if you are wrestling with this debate, reading Augustine's confessions will kind of give you the good, both sides of reason, wisdom. These are good things, but, um, you do need to have a different attitude than the one you take of kind of lofty pride in approaching. Uh, these texts, thinking you will understand them by your own logic before you're immersed in them, right? When you're when you're walking up a staircase, you actually look down. You look down at your feet at the steps, right? But you're still going up. Think about that kind of dichotomy when you're walking up steps because you have to look at your feet to, to make sure you're taking them. Eventually, you might get to the point where you don't have to look down while you're walking the steps, but especially, you know, think of a toddler who's walking up steps. They have to watch where they're going, okay? And that's how... St. Augustine talks about reading scripture. Okay. And then he goes on, for not as when I, when now I speak, did I feel when I tuned towards those scriptures, but they appeared to me to be unworthy to be compared with the dignity of Tully. That's uh, Marcus Tellius Cicero. And he talks about how he liked reading Cicero when he was uh, a young man. And Cicero is good at rhetoric. Cicero knows how to talk about these things as if they're lofty ideas. But when he's reading the scriptures, he thinks of them as childish. He talks about that earlier, but he brings it up again in a second. He says, For my inflated pride shunned their style, nor could the sharpness of my wit pierce their inner meaning. Yet truly were they such as we would develop in little ones. But I scorned to be a little one, and swollen with pride, I looked upon myself as a great one. Right? So think about it like this. So he, he thought of himself as an intellectual. Right, he's reading Cicero. He's reading philosophy. He's reading all of these things, and so when he comes across something he doesn't understand, or he doesn't immediately understand, only because he doesn't think of himself as a child in need of learning in that kind of disposition, right? Does he um, actually naively reject scripture because he thinks of it as childish? Because he thinks of himself as an adult, right? And he can't understand it. Or he, or he only sees the childish dimensions of it. He can't further plumb the depths of it yet, right? And because he doesn't understand it, he rejects it as childish. But in reality, it's actually something more complex than he's capable of understanding. And this gets into the fallen nature of, of humans. That's, the, that's a fundamental Christian doctrine too. So another one of the issues of wrestling with hell or any Christian doctrine or understanding of God is that... We are not supremely rational beings, and we're not supposed to be, and we can't understand everything, right? So at the beginning of the Christian narrative, it's not just that Adam and Eve eat from the tree of evil. They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their mistake is now they don't look to God as the arbiter of these things, but themselves, and they, and they pick and choose. And it doesn't mean that they'll always be wrong, but it does mean that they're capable of evil because they can pick and choose, right? And that's the flaw. It's this, it's this misuse of knowledge with yourself as the arbiter of truth and, and a kind of looking down on revelation. I talk about this in my presuppositionalism video that just came out, but I really think this is the core of these debates of how you come to these issues. And you do have to really, really wrestle with them. Okay, I'm gonna try to find this next clip as I like scroll through, <laughs> but uh, bear with me as I kind of as I kind of go through. It's 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 going to be kind of I think illuminating about reason and rationalism.
Yeah, that's more about, I think, that Gavin's a pr different approach, right? Again, he thinks, okay, well, if scripture is right, Jesus is right, he, he teaches hell. Uh, Matthew tries to fire back saying that Jesus doesn't really teach uh, eternal conscious torment. He does teach hell, I think he admits. But um, wrestling with that is is um, more difficult. Let me see if it's over here. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So this is this, this is the conversation. I think. Let me see if I can get to the beginning of it. Yeah. Okay. Can't hear the video clip. How about how about I stop scrolling through, and I kind of just summarize his points. I have notes. I think it'll be easier if I if I don't rely on the on the clips as much anyway. But basically, Matthew has an objection where he talks about ra ration, reason, all these things. So what Gavin argues is that some people would choose hell, and it would be up to a moral god to uh, allow them that choice, that freedom. And Matthew has two objections. His first objection is that an ultimately rational person, which God would be obliged to give them all the reason, give them all the options, give them the understanding and the choice, would not um, reject heaven. They wouldn't. And, uh, and that would be a, a fault of God. But then he also, uh, yeah, that's basically his point, but basically that idea that someone who is ultimately reasonable would always choose good. And even if they didn't, God would be morally obliged to force them to go to heaven, even if they didn't want to. In the same way that if somebody was going to jump into an, a volcano, and we knew that, that when at the, in that volcano, they would be subject to eternal conscious torment in that volcano, we would be obliged to force them to stop. And the first objection I would make is that this over-focusing on suitable rational faculties that he, that he kind of has um, actually is the error he's making. That humans, if they possess the ultimate rational faculties, would be like X, Y, Z. But what, what I think he did, you know, I think we have a tendency to visualize finitude versus infinitude in improper ways. A lot of times, if you think about it, this have you been on a playground as a kid and, you know, someone says, I dare you times infinity, and the other person says, I dare you times infinity plus one, Right. That's, a, that's an error. It's actually a scientific error because what you're doing is you're combining finite and infinite categories. There are real infinites and there are um, false infinites. So for instance, between the, the, the real number one and the real number two, there are an infinite number of fractions, but the space between one and two is actually finite. Um, understanding how that works gets into other interesting topics around infinity. I won't get into this time, but a true infinity can't actually be it, it's very difficult to understand for our minds because we work with with finite amounts the majority of the time. Um, so, so when when we talk about the ultimate rational faculty, suitable rational faculties, I think the mistake I would say from a logic perspective is that we could ever get to that point without being God, right? So think about it like this: Can you could you understand all of the factors involved in any moral decision? The answer is obviously no. You can't understand the consequences out far enough. You can't understand the factors going into it. You can't really understand the motivations, but you can envision yourself understanding one more factor than you currently understand. You can understand yourself under, uh, understanding someone's motivations better than you understand, but you would actually never get to the point with having the infinite capacity of understanding all that is necessary to make the right moral decision unless you're an infinite being. And the only infinite being is God. So humans, by our very nature of not being God, actually will never have the, per the, the ultimate rational faculties. And you might think of this as a condemnation of humanity that God is unfairly subjecting us to. 
but it's actually the very nature of humanity. So this is why Christians think of submission to God and the submission to these doctrines as a valuable virtue, because it, it it's actually a true statement. It comes from the factual understanding of the fact that you aren't um, infinite, that you aren't God. Uh, it, it's actually inherent in the distinction between God and humanity. It's a reasonable uh, assertion. It's a reasonable understanding. And even humans for the vast majority of history before, you know, Abrahamic religions understood that the individual human is actually not best situated for understanding these things. That's why they humans have always had a veneration of things like tradition, because tradition is the accumulated understanding of many people that 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 overcomes the biases and the vulnerabilities of the individual mind. But what I think has happened in modern society is we don't have that understanding of the of the limited nature of the individual mind. And really all that's required of the human being to offer to 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 ascertain salvation is really just an apprehension of that need to submit to the infinite God because of the positional inequality between us and God. So Matthew brings up later in the video, for instance, something that I can relate to a lot. He talks about his grandfather, who is was a really good man, calls him a good mensch. He was a Jewish man, though. And I relate to that. My grandfather, also Jewish, I think of him in the same way. He was a very pious Jew. Uh, and the question of whether or not he's ultimately saved. Now, I don't know whether my grandfather is will be in heaven in that, in that sense. Um, I don't know. Um, I have no reason to think that he is, though, if I'm being 100% honest, even though I loved him so much. I, you know, this isn't because I, I don't care about him that I, that I can't say that I know that he's in heaven. Um, and that I would have to be, if you ask me, what do I think? I might logically be required to say, I think he's not in heaven. He never accepted Jesus Christ. And you might say, that sounds so unfair. He was a good man. Matthew brings this up. I can't imagine him in eternal conscious torment despite that he was a quote unquote good person. Now, lots of Christians will start to say, hey, well, you're not really a good person. The original sin, they'll talk about all these things. But even Martin Luther was able to draw a distinction between civic righteousness and righteousness before the eyes of God. And the way an atheist is prone, primed to think is they'll say basically civic righteousness, righteousness before the eyes of society, before the, the, the eyes of, of, of your fellow man is the important thing. Because that's all we can really know. We can't know this kind of cosmic righteousness. And it feels almost wrong to hold us blameworthy from the positional inequality. I don't even know how cosmically unrighteous I am because I'm not all-knowing. But really what's required of, of someone is have faith in Christ. And the reason that faith has this unique role in the Christian worldview. And that has to be in, you know, lots of religions believe you have to believe what they believe, of course. But the, the, the reason you have to have a faith in Jesus Christ is that Jesus is actually the, the bridging of the gap between us and God in, in such a way that he makes it even logically possible that we could enter heaven. He's the, he's the acceptance of the apprehension of our, of our lowliness and our necessity for God in actually achieving uh, morality, if that makes sense. The, the moral worldview is in the Christian idea is actually about a manifestation of good on earth that is impossible unless uh, that would be impossible without the God man. And so understanding that that there is a God man, he, his submission, submission to the God man is actually necessary is or is the 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 salvation experience. That's the gospel that we're delivering to humankind. The reason that it's a good news is because without Jesus, it's actually uh, logically impossible to achieve um, virtue. It's logically impossible to um, achieve heaven, right? This will get into my kind of, um, my, my, my summative thought on the way that we're talking about heaven and, and, and hell in this conversation and the way that it ends up being talked about um, in a lot of these dialogues about hell, because what people think heaven and hell are, are the point of Christianity. A and it's not really the point. And you might be like, what? It kind of is, right? Salvation is about going to heaven. And that's, and that's positionally true. It's categorically true, but it's not, um, 
ultimately the f- the full view of what's going on here, right? So if you actually look into, so for instance, I, I had a conversation recently with Redeemed Zoomer where um, he was like, oh, Jews are Pelagians. And I corrected him uh, because as someone who looked into Jewish theology, Jews, even rabbinic Jews today, and we'll have a conversation about Second Temple Jews in a second, but even rabbinic Jews today actually aren't Pelagians. What they don't think is that you get to heaven by doing good works. What they think is that you are God's covenant people and you owe God good works, but God chose his covenant people despite their sins and and actually elects them by grace as his chosen people and will resurrect them on the final day. In modern Judaism, in real uh, like Orthodox rabbinic Judaism, there is not a... Um, there is not as much of an emphasis on the uh, heaven-hell aspect. If you get into these theologies, you can find explanations, but this is where Christianity and Judaism diverge. Because at the Second Temple period, what was the focus of Jews and Christians in this period was the final resurrection, right? This is why, and people will point out, oh, Paul thought the end times were coming. He didn't think about uh, heaven that much. People talk about you will see, you know, this generation shall not pass before um, uh, before I come in my glory. People aren't thinking about the intermediate stage between our time on earth as God's covenant people and the final resurrection. They are focused on the final resurrection. Am I in God's covenant to the point where I will be a part of that priesthood of God's chosen people who will reign on the new heavens and on the new earth um, in the final resurrection? If you like, if, if you want to learn more about, about this debate and, and really the scholarship on this, N.T. Wright does a lot of work on what this kind of period looked like and what this theology looked like. Now, as Christian history progressed and people worked out what this meant, they were debating about what this intermediate stage looks like. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we can't know because there was a debate in the church and in the early church, but what we can know is that there were some Christians in the early church who advocated for soul sleep. Basically, oh, you you die and then you're asleep, right? Christ talks, uh, Christ. Paul talks a lot about people going to sleep in Christ, as in being uh, bodily dead, until the resurrection. But the uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox Christians reject soul sleep as, a, as an idea and, and point out the doctrine of heaven it, as the all as the as the correct way of understanding what is happening to souls souls are conscience right we have a cloud of witnesses the saints are in heaven observing us actively um and not just uncognizant of what's going on on earth until the resurrection but the resurrection is the goal so when we're talking about the schema of salvation in christianity it is about who will be included in the final resurrection and heaven is the waiting place so when Talking about how do you get to heaven is actually a shorthand for the full schema of salvation in the Christian worldview. Okay, that's one thing I think a lot of Christians, uh, people inquiring into Christianity, don't understand, and even some Christians probably don't understand the the real sense of bodily resurrection and the importance of that in Christian in Christianity and in in in, in the tradition that Christianity evolved out of or kind of inherited from a pre Christ pre Christ Judaism, right? is this emphasis on the resurrection. Okay, but the corollary of that is Gehenna or Sheol. People try to use these terms to um, dismiss the doctrine of hell because they're not the word hell. Hell, of course, is a is an English word borrowed from a Germanic pagan system uh, where hell was one of the planets that um, creatures lived on in the um, Norse mythology system. And it, in, the, in the language of English that we speak today, we use that word to talk about the realm of the dead, but the realm of the dead is a concept in scripture. So in Hebrew, that's Sheol or Gehenna, but in the New Testament, Paul is perfectly comfortable using the word Hades, which is also borrowed from, from, from Greek to talk about the land of the dead. And he doesn't by any means use the word Hades to uh, imply that the Greeks are correct about uh, salvation, basically. He's just talking about the realm of the dead. And what does the realm of the dead look like? Well, we know um, from Christian tradition, Christ goes down, descends to the dead, right? That's what we talk about in the Apostles' Creed. 
and it was called the harrowing of Hades, the harrowing of the dead. He went to the dead and some people, you know, there's lots of speculation in the church about what exactly happens here. But, but basically there's a transformation of the realm of the dead at Christ's crucifixion. This is basically what's happening on Saturday, right? Um, so, right, Christ dies on a Friday. It's Good Friday in, in the liturgical traditions. Christ, and then he, you know, he's a good Jew, so he's resting, right, on, on the Sabbath. And then on Sunday, the first day, he, he rises again. Some people will say, oh, that's not really three days. That's like only like 30 hours or something. But it, it, it takes place over the course of three days, right? Friday afternoon, the fullness of Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, he's harrowing hell. And what we understand, what we would understand is at this point, the dead who are not a part of the final resurrection are excluded from the final resurrection, which means you know, either annihilationism or eternal conscious torment because of the imperishability of the soul is basically where this understanding comes from, right? That annihilationism isn't, isn't possible. Now, I do think there are good arguments for annihilationism. annihilationism. I used to be an annihilationist myself. This idea of, well, wouldn't in some way people in hell be getting eternal life if they don't get obliterated at some point? And, and those arguments work. And that's not what I'm here to, to dis distinguish between. I'm just here to talk about why universalism isn't really the, the Christian approach and why, and, and try to make an appeal that it's actually not the best approach either. It, it is fitting. It is logical. It is good. And um, to have hell and what it, what it really means. Okay. So there's an exclusion from the covenant. And we know from Galatians, Romans, in, in the New Testament, that the people that are included in, in the covenant are included by faith. Um, and, and those people are included by faith. And that's, you know, we're going to avoid the distinguishing ideas between orthodoxy and Catholicism and, and Protestantism. But, but actually, all of those traditions have, in some sense, the ability to say we are included in the covenant by faith. Okay. Um, and so if you don't have faith, you're not included in the covenant, you're excluded from the final resurrection, and that is the doctrine that Christians believe. And the reason you have to, to have this understanding for the final resurrection is it's, a, it's about that um, submission to God is actually the, 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 the thing that makes the final resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth, actually possible. Because when the, the new heavens and the new earth actually have come, come about, we will actually, this is a, another biblical doctrine that's kind of overlooked, we'll actually have a substantive role in, in facilitating the new heavens and the new earth. We will have a place. There, you know, People will be farming and they will continue farming. There will be a farmer in the new heavens and the new earth and they'll live forever, all that kind of stuff. Right? And so in some sense, they actually ha are required to have, have an understanding of submission to God. And God, and Gavin brings this up a number of times, um, as the moral arbiter, decided that that should be a free will choice of ours. And the retort that, that I'm hoping to address now um, by Matthew is that, well, shouldn't God just include people in it by force? He shouldn't care about our free will because, like I said before, he has this understanding the, from the secular worldview that the way to have a moral order is to minimize suffering and uh, I guess maximize liberty would also be the, the corollary of the secular worldview, but he doesn't really get into that as much. Okay. Um, and, and that's the, the point, but really what God is trying to do with the system of salvation is actually trying to facilitate and create um, stewards of the new heavens of the new and the new earth. This is the doc. This is the, the link between the priesthood and the monarchy, the idea of kingship. This is why Christ has to be king and Christ has to become a person so that he can be the model of the king priest for us, right? This is what Melchizedek is. If you talk, if you look into this in the, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it's like, what does that mean? But Melchizedek is an Old Testament character who gives Abraham bread and wine. And the name Melchizedek, he's described as... Um, um, the the king of of Salem, which becomes Jerusalem, right, which is the kind of city of God on earth. Melchizedek, the name means king of, and then Zadok, or like if you you know Matthew, if you grew up Jewish, you do they go around during Hebrew school and they shake the little thing and they say, do you have any tzedakah? Tzedakah is charity, right? It's the idea that you you donate some money, right? But also charity, it's actually a, a broader understanding of charity that is more 
biblical than just money, right? So tzedek is like justice or peace or, you know, obviously the word peace is shalom, which is in Jerusalem, right? Shalom, shalom. Um, but he's kind of the king of justice, the king of peace. And that archetype of the, the priest, king, steward that we're supposed to inhabit is the, the point. God is trying to transform us into the perfect steward, the perfect um, king, priest of the new heavens and the new earth. And that's the goal. And so if you look at these, this understanding in, in from that lens, the idea that some people will be excluded starts to make sense. Now, what um, Matthew will then say is he shouldn't give us free will to be able to not be good stewards. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. But in a sense, we're using the word we and you in a way that I think starts stops making sense. So if if you didn't have free will, you actually wouldn't be you. You would it would be a a, a different thing. It would be the the puppet or the idea or the thing that. God created to stand in that place. We would all be more like animals, right? There's no moral nature to it. We're not stewards after the image of God either in that sense, right? Because the God does have free will, right? God can do whatever God wants. And so in that way, to be perfect images of God, we do have to have substantive free will. The next thing is, uh, one of the ways that I made this, or I explained this doctrine earlier in my Christian uh, faith to a friend of mine who is secular, and I'm wondering if, this is a useful idiom. I'm still toying with it. But the idea is that if God, if when you died, say God separated the, the aspects of you as a person into the virtues and the, um, the, the sin, if you will, right? The, the bad parts of you, the parts of you that are committed to rebellion against the new heavens and the new earth order. Right. The stuff that can be reconciled with the new heavens and the new earth and the stuff that can't be reconciled with the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and if um, he did that, what parts would be left and what parts would, would go? Which of those parts are you as a, as a conscious in your mind, as a conscience, as, the, as an intellect, are, are you attached to? Right. This is why we can imagine a sinner going to heaven, because if the parts of me that I like, the parts of me that I identify with uh, the the habits the the the, the uh, understanding is my faith in god is that's the things that i take pride in that's the things that i glory in the things that i revel in then when that part of me is accepted into the new heavens and the new earth it's ultimately redeemed in some sense i as my conscience which is affiliated and identify with that um with that virtue will be a part of the new heavens and the new earth but if I don't identify with that, if I identify with something else, if I identify with um, the physical pleasures I've had, I have on earth, if I identify with, you know, my race or something like that, and I and that's my identity, and that's the thing that matters the most to me. When God discards that thing, if He discards that thing, right? But when He discards the things incompatible with the new heavens and the new earth, and I identify with the things being discarded, then I as I'm identifying and being discarded from the new heavens and the new earth. And it is an eternal separation from that. There won't be a second chance because the thing that I am is the thing that just got discarded. And this is a biblical theme as well. I think the, the retort that Matthew has again and again is that he doesn't actually think that the scriptures do teach this kind of eternal separation. He brings up a couple of examples for uh, one of the examples he gives is the the sheep and the goats, right? When uh, Jesus talks about separating the sheep and the goats, he says, well, he separates them, but the goats aren't, you know, if you were actually a shepherd, you don't just burn all your goats forever in eternal conscious torment. You use them. They're, 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 they're animals that you take care of. So why would they be discarded? How does that analogy get you to eternal conscious torment? Um, but this is missing in, uh, the reference of the sheep and the goats to uh, Leviticus, where there is the there are two goats. One of them is being sacrificed in the temple, so it is being killed for the sins of the people. And there's another goat that's being sent out into the wilderness and is being sacrificed to Azazel, um, and is allowed to live free, allowed to escape. It is the goat that escapes, the the scapegoat, if you will, to kind of in that sense, it's kind of to appease the. We don't know why, right? There's this idea of these goats being a part of the the ultimate 
part of the 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 punishment, the fiduciary um, destruction that's inherent in redemption. That's what the sacrifice is. It's the means of redemption. And so some things are destroyed as a part of redemption. And that's actually something that a Christian would look at as justice. That's the difference between our worldviews is that um, there is a sense in which destruction and suffering can be rejoiced in. And Gavin brings up a good point it, that today in our modern world, the doctrine of hell has come under a lot of criticism. But in the past, when people lived in much more brutal conditions, when evil and brutality were much more common, when war was much more common, people didn't object to hell as much as they do today. In fact, you can find, I believe in, in Anselm, him trying to defend the doctrine of heaven because people just manifestly understood that it, humans didn't necessarily deserve that and that it was too cheap, right? Uh, that we could ever be, uh, you know, go to heaven and that everyone deserves hell. And if you've ever truly been mistreated or whatever, you realize that one of our intuitions that that can be satisfied in the justice that we find in the scriptures is this need for revenge, this understanding that this can't go on and that evil has to be destroyed or defeated, right? In Lord of the Rings, which is the example where he talks about, will all good things be? will all things become good again, right? There is a defeat of Sauron, the orcs, all of these things in the world are actually destroyed or, or, or defeated. And you might say, okay, well, those things are not human characters, but the humans and the wizards that um, side with Sauron are also destroyed. Grimma Wormtongue, uh, Saruman, Denethor. Denethor literally burns, right? Uh, he, he's, lit on, he's lit on fire as being an impediment to the to the to the conquest of good of the world and the defeat of evil and the defeat of evil is something we also rejoice in in as much as we rejoice in and take uh satisfaction and glorify and, and glory in the redemption of good in the world and so um uh part of this is the is the christian worldview the example i always give is in for, is in Jude one, technically Jude is all Jude one. There's only one chapter in Jude. The author of the epistle, Jude, eponymously, talks about um, the last time Jesus, that when Jesus came, right? Uh, did he not usher in an age of destruction against the wicked? He's using this to rebuke the people he's writing to that have become wicked in the church, like they're doing evil stuff. And that is a part of the redemption, basically, is what he's saying. And when he says the last time there was a Jesus, basically, when Jesus took our people out of Egypt or into Canaan, I think it, it is exactly. I should probably pull it up to, for simplicity's sake, but I won't. Um, you can find it. It's literally one of the shortest epistles. But he's talking about Joshua, right? Because in Hebrew, Yeshua and Yehoshua, Joshua is the, the name for Jesus. So they're the same character. And in the book of Joshua... Joshua is a military leader who is actually defeating evil in the world and, and destroying the Canaanites who are child sacrificers, all of this kind of stuff. So in the salvation of Israel and that salvation story, because these are all small salvation stories that play themselves out on the cosmic scale with the rebirth and ultimate re and new creation of the world, right? A part of the formula is the destruction of evil. And in a sense, that is, and this is where we get back to C.S. Lewis's example that, that Gavin gives. Why do these things have to be destroyed? And I think C.S. Lewis gives a good example that's very biblical or a good way of thinking about it. Well, this is what the necessary entailment of rejecting God is, is destruction. And so if you read the book of Joshua, um, he's told to bring destruction to the things devoted to destruction. And if you read that kind of, again, with that kind of simple way of looking at it, the childish way of looking at it. God finds something and devotes it to destruction. And then Joshua is ordered and the people among Joshua's camp, uh, the Israelites are the, 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 the physical means of destroying the thing God ordered to destruction. But if you look at all the other examples in scripture, when something is destroyed by God, especially these things are already devoted to their own destruction. Evil has this kind of self-defeating principle. That's why evil can't be in the new heavens and the new earth. It's it 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 imposes conflict. It introduces conflict. It introduces contradictions. Um, it introduces destruction. And if the new heavens and the new earth will be eternal, then evil 
would undermine that that principle. So um, evil is kind of its own consequence. And so when evil is destroyed, we're actually manifesting the fate of of evil in a, in a visual sense. So in the same way that God is glorified by the redemption of goodness, God is also glorified because that's the consequence of goodness, right? Is eternal life, all these things. Um, because it's because goodness in itself is unity with God. God is the infinite source of everything. So so eternal life is again one of those returns to in, infinity, never endingness, right? Versus death, right? So when sin is introduced into the world, death is the consequence. And there's a sense in which sin creates death because it needs to be excised. It's almost as if this we live in like kind of a a, a self cleansing system, right? If if the system wants to last forever any of the stuff that would you know stop it from lasting forever will eventually defeat itself because the 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 creation order at the beginning was actually good right so our good natural order of the world was created um right when in genesis 1 god created it and it was good that natural order um um excludes evil on purpose and you can actually see this again in lord of the rings um, hopefully you like Lord of the Rings. I, I noticed you guys mentioned it a couple times, so I'll use some of these examples. What actually destroys the ring in the end is not Frodo's goodness and giving up the ring. Um, we know from the previous story with Isildur that that's actually not how evil is destroyed, is by goodness and bravery, and, and there's just this good man who can give up the temptation of the ring. But instead, Gollum, who almost didn't deserve the pity that goodness was giving him the whole time. That's the tension with Gollum. You're wondering, why are they bringing this guy along? Sam, Samwise Gamgee, who everyone respects actually is a good character, the whole time is like, we should kill we should kill Gollum, we should get rid of Gollum, all this other stuff. But actually the end, it's because of Gollum's deprived nature that he cannot let Frodo risk the ring or have the ring. So he plots against Frodo and tries to take the ring from Frodo, spoiler alert, and falls into Mount Doom. Sorry, I should have said spoiler alert earlier for um, Lord of the Rings, but it's actually Gollum's evil and wickedness that actually ends up being the the, nece the means of the destruction of the ring. Um, and that's kind of how the creation order works. This is why we're, we pity evil, because it's self-defeating, because it's self-destructive, um, because it introduces death into the world. And so as Christians also, this is the next, you know, problem antiquity had against Christianity that isn't as much today. But the ancient world used to think of Christians as silly for being forgiving because it doesn't it seem like you're going to get taken advantage of. But the forgiveness actually comes as a corollary of the understanding that evil is its own punishment. It's its own road to destruction. Right. And that um, evil, whatever that is, is actually just a rejection of goodness. And goodness in itself, this is the next thing I think that has to be understood by the person approaching Christianity. Uh, goodness in itself is actually what happens when we have the right hierarchy of the good. And at the top of the good is God, because God is the source of all goodness. So even the other things that we would recognize as good are just emanations from that single, divinely simple source of goodness that is God. Um, and so... What will what what what's actually happening when someone tries to justify, you know, uh, un unfortunately, like I think we were talking about like my grandfather, who's a very good man. And when I say he was a good man, I mean, he had a pretty good approximation of what the hierarchy of goods was. And he was a strong willed person. He was all these things. But it wasn't actually the exact properly ordered hierarchy of goods. And that is what heaven looks like is the exact rightly ordered property of goods. And what God says is as long as you get the top right, the top will fix the cascading hierarchy of goods all the way down, right? So you can imagine somebody who, um, for instance, they enjoy um, the marital union, the marital act, which in Christianity, that's sex, right? But they're married. So, but then they, they take the marital act outside of the marital context. That's adultery. I think everyone, even non-Christians would, would agree adultery is wrong. And, and it's not because sex is wrong, but it's because it's not been contextualized. And the higher, the higher good, uh, a higher good than sex is marriage. And so 
what happens when you have sex outside of marriage is you prioritize sex over marriage, and that's a misordering of the hierarchy of goods. The same thing can happen when, you know, eating food is good. The wedding at Cana is, is, is an example of this, but in the Christian Judeo-Christian tradition, especially classical Judeo-Christianity, drinking, having fun, eating, being merry is actually good in itself. The problem is when you put drinking, you put eating, you put all these things over other higher goods. So you become a drunk and you become rude and crass and kindness and gentleness are more important than the pleasure of drinking. Um, and that's that's a Christian understanding of, of, all, of how this works. So much so that some faithful Christian traditions have just basically said, stop drinking. And monks, for instance, probably won't drink uh, and because they know that they themselves, an alcoholic or someone who knows that they would go from zero to 100 if they did drink even a little bit would misorder goodness, even if in theory there is a, a proper place for enjoying uh, alcoholic beverages. Okay. And so that misordered hierarchy is a consequence of, the, of our fallen nature, right? Where we have a knowledge of good and evil and we make that hierarchy for ourselves. And so doing that, making that hierarchy for ourselves is the problem, which I think is at the under the underlayer of this entire conversation. And again, if you're watching this, um, Matthew, I'd love to have a conversation with you about, about this, but um, basically I would say that that would be the, and of course, actually, I think Gavin Orland does a great job in this conversation talking to these issues. I'm not saying um, this, this isn't meant to be a, a dig at him, but I think with all the hindsight and the preparation that I made for this video, um, I think that is the, the underlying difference. And you might have your objections and that's fine. But that is the difference in the Christian worldview and the um, secular worldview that I think you're kind of coming out of, which is why you're having this clash. And which is why you'll find, I think, you know, lots of Christians who will object to your kind of stance on universalism. And that doesn't mean that that they're um, that they're wrong, but some of them probably can be crass about it. And I don't want that to dissuade you. But I also do think um, that universalism isn't true and that you should be Christian. And, and this is basically why I think it's just. And the attitude that I would that that I try to take in these videos, which I think is preferable to the attitude um, that I took when I was secular, that I think you're kind of um, similar to, and that I'm reading from your from your conversations, is I, I only know what's good because of a relationship with God, and that's that's a revelation basically, and I can't um, discover that my own. So when I go to scripture or I go to any of these things and say. I wouldn't believe this unless it was morally consistent with the way I understand morality. It, it's actually, it's actually, even if you did in theory, uh, um, adopt Christianity, in my opinion, with that worldview, with that understanding, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't really be the right way of approaching Christianity. Um, in the first place, because that is actually a misunderstanding of, of the, the moral apprehension. And what I will say, though, at the end of this, and I want to say this to some um, Christian objectors uh, who may be watching this, who who think that approaches like this are bad, and that, for instance, somebody should just be like, you should submit to God, you should submit to the word of God, you should submit to the traditions of the church, and no further explanation. But I will say, I know lots of Christians, myself included, I have a friend, who when they first became Christian, were in very unorthodox Christians because they still had all that baggage. But all it took at the very beginning of the journey was accepting God as the highest good. And once they did that, then the other stuff starts to order itself slowly over time. And then they did start to accept all of these different positions. When I first became Christian, I was kind of a Unitarian. When I first became Christian, I was kind of a Universalist. And it was only actually after being a Christian for a long time and I think this is a testimony to the Christian idea of the Holy Spirit and sanctification. It was only after time and after participating in the life of the church that I slowly became more orthodox in my Christianity. And what the, the, the Christian theologian actually is desiring to do isn't to find the truth at all costs a lot of the time, um, although that is the consequence of the Christian journey. It's to understand God's revelation and 
in understanding God's revelation, a lot of times what that will do is it'll make you capable of explaining the goodness of God's positions. But we should learn to accept what in the way that Gavin is doing in this video, things we don't immediately understand about the Christian faith. Because otherwise, we're not rightly ordering our understanding of how we get moral goods. I think even Matthew understands this in the way that he talks in the video about the appeal of Christianity. And, and he says that in the atheist worldview, there really is a source of goodness. And so he understands that God in this ultimate understanding would be the source of goodness. And a true apprehension of God as the source of goodness implies submission versus recognizing, and I think a lot of Christians do this actually, and I think a lot of um, boomer cons do this. I think a lot of more establishment people, kind of mainline Christians, kind of um, conservative culture warriors who like the idea of religion do this, where they accept God as a creature so that they can have a, a moral worldview. And then accepting that God exists so that morality exists, use independent means to understand morality rather than understanding that God is the source of morality and that his revelation would be the way we would even have any possible way of apprehending uh, that morality because of the nature of God and the nature of revelation and the nature of goodness. Okay, that's the, that was my explanation. I know this is long. It's an hour and 11 minutes, but hopefully people will get a lot out of this. Hopefully um, it made sense. Hopefully the little mess up with the technology at the beginning is kind of easy to pass over. And hopefully this is digestible. I don't want to go on for too much longer because I do. I am worried that what will happen is um, people won't click on this video if it's like two hours long and rewatch it later. Didn't have a lot of live attendance, but that's fine. That's normal for um, it's normal for a mid a midday stream on a weekday. Um, so it, it, if you liked the video, be sure to like the actual video. Like go to the little corner and like it. Be sure to subscribe to my channel at Sub Umbra. My name is Joe. If you want to support me. Um, I have a locals and you can find the link to that on my page. Um, it, otherwise, if you like the content, if you want to interact with the content, don't be afraid to comment. Don't be afraid to message me. Matthew, if you want to have a conversation, I would love to. Um, and in other words, God bless. Thank you so much.